We are very happy to uh, have you here. And it's now, uh, let's talk about your research. Thank you very much for your... Okay, so th thanks, Jan, for inviting me. And uh, everyone, thanks for your patience. <laughs> yeah, so with your permission, I would also, I would like to cover different diseases because this is a concept that I'd like to, you know, lay out to you that is not disease specific. It's about regulating the immune response. Uh, we published a, uh, a you know, very nice paper, I think, last week in Cell, uh, that's about cancer. So I, I try to integrate, you know, these different diseases, but, the, uh, you know, I will, the, about half of the, the lecture will be about cardiovascular disease. Um, is, if that's okay. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So I'll share my screen. All right. Okay. Can can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. Oh, excellent. Um, so traditionally, if we look at the host defense immune response, um, um, and you know, which is you know very current at the moment in, the, in this COVID pandemic. Uh, um, there's first a, a you know the innate immune response, which is a rapid, effective, non 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 specific, lacks immunological memory. Uh, the reason that young people are very resistant to SARS-CoV-2 infection is because of the innate immune response. So the the, the innate immune response, uh, you know, while you're aging, gets muted, um, and that's why you see, you know, um, in in people that you know are older than 30, 40, and particularly elderly people, and you see that they suffer from this most, and it's it's, it's really related, at least that's what the latest evidence indicates, is differences in the innate immune response. Um, <clears throat> so, if an infection then uh, progresses, then the you know the adaptive immune response becomes more dominant, and the adaptive immune response you know needs time, it's very specific, and it builds immunological memory. So this is the classical view of looking at immunological memory and the host defense system. Um, <clears throat> however, um, if we zoom in on the cells that orchestrate the, uh, these immune responses, so the innate immune response that you see on the left and, and the adaptive immune response on the right, we, <clears throat> if we focus on this a little, in a little bit more detail, then the innate immune response, particularly orchestrated by, by myeloid cells, um, uh, monocytes, macrophages, uh, dendritic cells, um, uh, and, you know, true antigen presentation you see on the right, and, you know, adaptive immunity and T and B cell immunity then can be uh, uh, generated. And so the adaptive immune response traditionally is considered to have a a memory function, uh, the innate immune response is nonspecific. And so <clears throat> this has been challenged, um, this paradigm, um, by um, you know, a new concept in immunology, um, because what has been observed is that there is some kind of very primitive, nonspecific, innate immune memory in myeloid cells. Um, so when a myeloid cell encounters a pathogen, and this is something that you can simulate um, in a petri dish uh, so that you can expose for example a, a macrophage or monocytes to the bcg vaccine that induces epigenetic and metabolic rewiring of these cells also actually metabolic rewiring underlying epigenetic modifications um, <clears throat> and these epigenetic modifications um, allow these cells which otherwise behave let's say normally um, allows these cells to be more responsive to subsequent and there can be unrelated uh, challenge. Um, and, so, and so this concept of trained immunity was, um, was discovered by Mihai Neteas, um, you know, sort of close collaborator, he's at the Red Rock University Medical Center. And this kind of captures what is going on on the molecular level. So there's pathogen recognizing receptors, for example, Dectin-1, that can recognize um, uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And in this case, it's Dectin-1 that, that kind of like senses uh, uh, fungi. Um, Beta-glucan is, is, is present in, in, in several microbes. 
Um, and so the activation of Dectin-1 leads to metabolic rewiring, and that underlies all kinds of changes um, at the level of histones, so epigenetic changes that gives enhanced accessibility to specific genes, particularly genes that, rela uh, that are related to uh, cytokine uh, production. And so essentially when a cell is epigenetic rewired, you know, according to this tra trained immunity concept, then these cells are more alert. And so they, they, they can respond much faster and stronger to subsequent insult. And so this is a pretty powerful paradigm. Um, and so, um, you know, the biology, uh, there's still a lot of stuff that's being discovered. Eh? So it's not only pathogen associated molecular patterns, but it's also damage associated molecular patterns. Um, you know, for the people on this call, OxLDL, for example, also induces trained immunity. His work from uh, Professor Niels Richter, also from Rockwell University Medical Center. Um, but, um, you know, from an engineering perspective, so from, from my perspective, it gives a really beautiful framework you know, for innate immune regulation. And so can we induce trained immunity, particularly to, for example, enhance the resistance to, to infection or uh, as an anti-cancer uh, uh, strategy? Or can we prevent the induction of trained immunity or, you know, dampen hyperinflammation, which is particularly relevant to cardiovascular disease? So I, I sketched that on, you know, two slides ago that, so what, what is this trained immunity? It's a concept that when uh, Eve myeloid cells are exposed to, for example, beta-glucan or peptidoglycans or BCG or OxLDL, and they get activated. Um, and after, you know, you let these cells rest for a while, and, and this is in the context of a Petri dish, um, you see that these cells are quiescent, but they still have these histone marks. And upon re-stimulation, you see this amplified and stronger response. Okay, so this, this is nice, but doesn't explain, you know, why, in, for example, in patients, but also in, in animal models, it, trained immunity um, it can be induced for a much longer period than the lifespan of a myeloid cell. So monocytes have a lifespan of a couple of days. So, so that, that doesn't explain... The, 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 let's say, the duration of uh, trained immunity. So then we have to zoom in on, on where uh, myeloid cells and other immune cells are produced. That's, so that's in the bone marrow. Um, and so, you know, pioneering work from me, INAT and others has shown that um, trained immunity becomes a property of the progenitor cells, myeloid progenitor cells, uh, particularly in the bone marrow. So that means that if you are able to regulate the immune response at the level of myeloid cell progenitors, you know, you can actually accomplish, potentially you can accomplish a lot. Um, and so this is kind of like our vision for how can we directly engage myeloid progenitor cells in the bone marrow to kind of take control of the innate immune response. Yeah, so um, essentially it's this. And so we would like to take control of the immune response by focusing on myeloid cells, so antigen presenting cells. Uh, and then essentially, because there's this interplay with adaptive immunity that, you know, in, in, in kind of in theory, sh you should allow us to take control of the entire innate immune response, uh, uh, the in, uh, entire um, immune response, innate and adaptive immune response. And so we would target the myeloid cell compartment um, and then, you know, we can regulate different processes. Strained immunity is one example, but you can also think about uh, co-stimulation, so uh, signal two. That's also something that you could, you could in principle, uh, regulate at the level of antigen-presenting cells and not at the level of T cells. Um, okay, so this is, you know, this is the concept, this is kind of our vision. Um, and so how, how do we actually want to achieve this? And so there's, there's in a Petri dish, there's many compounds that can induce trained immunity. Uh, you can either not infuse them intravenously or they will never reach the myeloid cell compartment. So we focus on nanotechnology. Um, we also integrate a lot of imaging in our studies because we'd like to understand, you know, how that nanotechnology behaves. Um, and, and, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's three diseases that we, you know, mostly focus on. So atherosclerotic disease, um, transplantation, and cancer. I'll start off with, you know, the nanotechnology. So what we use are 
our body's own building blocks. And, you know, for, you know, this audience, everyone knows good cholesterol, high density lipoprotein. Um, it's essentially an aggregate of fatty molecules and a apolipoprotein called apolipoprotein A1. And because of the integration of apolipoprotein A1, these natural nano delivery systems, they interact with uh, innate immune cells. And there you see the interaction with the macrophage. So this is something that we can, um, we can mimic. And so this is a concept in nature that as a biomedical engineer that we would like to take advantage of. Um, and so if you look at the morphology or the architecture, as you, so you will, of um, a lipoprotein, you can clearly see that there's a lot of opportunities, you know, for a chemist to work with. And so you see there's something hydrophobic in the core of these lipoproteins. Um, the lipoproteins are covered with a monolayer of amphiphilic phospholipids and then has APOA1 in integrated or other apolipoproteins. And so <clears throat> this is a beautiful example of our body's own nano delivery system. Um, and uh, it's also known, for example, uh, hepatitis C enters hepatocytes through um, the merging with uh, lipoproteins. And so there's a lot of biological um, opportunities for these type of structures. So what we essentially do, and this is just a uh, whiteboard an animation, so don't take it too serious, but um, conceptually, this is what we do. So we, we take human plasma and that is then subjected to extensive uh, centrifugation procedures. We isolate the high density lipoprotein fraction and we disassemble the lipoprotein. We put in a payload and we re reassemble this. Again, this is not what we literally do. You know, we, we essentially extract individual components and then we use microfluidics technology to create libraries of what we call nanobiologics. And the reason we call them nanobiologics and not lipoproteins is that after we're done with them, they don't really resemble lipoproteins that much. Uh, they have phospholipids and they have maybe fatty molecules integrated and apolipoprotein A1, but it's not necessarily, um, for example, high density lipoprotein anymore. Um, and so we have these different constituents, uh, so it can be triglycerides, essential obviously are apolipoprotein A1 and phospholipids and maybe uh, other type of fatty molecules like cholesterol. Um, and then we can make spherical particles and they look like this. Uh, if we leave out the hydrophobic payload, it can also be tri um, um, cholesterol esters. And these are also really hydrophobic and they go into the core. That's actually the, the natural function of high density lipoprotein to transport these type of molecules. But if we leave that out, then you get discoidal uh, materials. Um, yeah, and they interact um, with myeloid cell progenitors in the bone marrow. Okay, so you have something that very efficiently engages the bone marrow and, and myeloid cells and myeloid cell progenitors uh, in the bone marrow, also in the spleen and in the blood. Um, and so, but these things by themselves are benign. And so they, you know, they circulate for a long time. You know, they have a very favorable tox profile and because this, this is natural and this is something that also occurs in our bodies. And so by themselves, they're benign. So what we then do is we, we, in very extensive studies, we, we kind of play with the size of these nanobiologics. That's what you see here is a, is a discoidal nanobiologic that is about 20 nanometers. We can make them 35, 65. We can grow them up to over 100. Uh, these things are not that stable. Eh? So what we've done here is we, we essentially have taken the 20, 35, 65 nanometer nanobiologics and then we, we done pretty extensive screening and look at uh, particularly bone marrow uptake. Okay, so, so that's the nanotechnology. So we've been working on, we have created large libraries of, of nanobiologics that are different in composition and in, in, in size uh, and morphology. Um, but um, I'm gonna show now the application in the context of transplantation and cancer. And the reason why I showed it in the context of both these diseases, because in, you could look at transplantation and cancer as two sides of the same immunological coin. In transplantation, there is an immune response, whereas you would like to um, uh, see uh, a tolerant immune system. Um, and, and kind of in cancer, it's, it's exactly the other way around. 
So this is the, the study I'd like to present. This will go in, in, in kind of details of these experiments because, um, you know, we I made some animations and I, I think, it, you know, it kind of walks you through how this technology works, what kind of process it induces, and then how that is, is a very effective anti-cancer therapy. Now, all this work and this kind of idea is based on the work by me, Inetea, with BCG. And so the BCG vaccine is actually the, um, he observed, um, let's say, non-specific kind of memory effects in myeloid cells. And um, after um, having medical students vaccinate, that were vaccinated with the BCG vaccine, and then when they looked at the PBMCs of, of these individuals, it seemed that these particular monocytes became more resistant to, to infections of uh, non-related uh, pathogens. And so there was initially, it's like, this is very strange, what's going on here? This, this is about 10 years ago now, and and they published this uh, study called the Activate study, I believe it was about two months ago in Cell, which really nicely shows that, the, that there's non-specific protective effects of BCG vaccination in the elderly. They actually observed a 80% reduction over a period of three years in respiratory tract infections. And so particularly in, in, in the current zeitgeist with, with a COVID pandemic, which is also, you know, a, a coronavirus, like, like uh, lots of respiratory tract infections. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, we're hopeful that, you know, that this could work as some kind of mitigation strategy to, to protect the, elder, uh, the elderly. Um, and there's, I believe more than 15 trials ongoing at the moment worldwide. Okay, so what does this BCG have to do with, uh, you know, with our study? Um, let me show this to you. This is work done by, by two PhD students, Bram Prim and Mandy van Leent. What we've essentially done is we've taken the ingredient, the molecular structure in the BCG vaccine that induces trained immunity, and we kind of templated that or copied that on, on top of our nanobiologic. And so then we have a nanobiologic that by itself is benign because the surface is decorated um, and with, you know, peptidoglycan derivatives that, you know, that um, uh, me and and his team identified to be the molecular structure that induces trained immunity. We decorated these nanobiologics with peptidoglycan derivatives. And so then you have a nanobiologic that can, very, can be very safely applied to engage um, the bone marrow, the spleen, um, and then, you know, in, in, in theory should induce trained immunity. So we published this, this work last, last week. Um, and I'm going to walk you through the study. So on, on top, you'll see animation of what's going on on the level of the immune system and, and the tumor. And then in the, in the bottom of the slides, I will show actual data. Okay, so I think all of you know that um, you know, immune cells are, are produced in the bone marrow by, you know, they, they, they are essentially hematopoietic stem cells and multipotent progenitors give rise to, you know, all kinds of different types of immune cells, myeloid cells, uh, lymphoid cells. And um, the, the problem in, at least in, in some tumors, and we're focusing in, in this study on melanoma, is that in melanoma, the innate immune system actually works with the tumor um, against the adaptive immune responses. And so, and th this is an evolutionary concept. Um, and that's also how embryos protect themselves against the, the mother. Um, that's by forming a rim of immunosuppressive myeloid cells that essentially block T cells from uh, attacking the tumor. Okay, so now we go back to our nanobiologics. Uh, so they, they're decorated with these peptidoglycan derivatives. So essentially you have a nano-sized artificial microbe. We, we intravenously administer these nanobiologics and then they circulate. We can radio label these nanobiologics so that we can quantitatively um, um, determine the, the blood half-life of these nanobiologics. We can perform PET imaging and then we can nicely see that um, there's a very high propensity for the bone marrow. Um, Obviously, the liver is, is always, when you intravenously administer 
uh, nanomaterials is, is always uh, a clearance organ, but there's a relative favorable uptake in the bone marrow as compared to the uh, to the liver. Right? So we, the, it's it's in the in a similar range in terms of uptake and concentration. Yeah. Then we can also uh, give me one second. Just a little noise. <clears throat> so then there is, um, what we've also done is intervital microscopy. We can also fluorescently label these nanobiologics and, and then we've performed live microscopy on the skull of mice. And so you can nicely see on the left, the accumulation in the bone marrow. These were uh, uh, B16 F mice that, that were inoculated with B16F10 tumors. So they also have tumors. And um, yeah, this is kind of like a derivative effect. They also accumulate in the tumor, but that's not like what we're looking for. And so normally in the, in the field of nanomedicine, you would like tumor targeting. We, we're not too concerned about it. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. It should, let's say, uh, train cells in the same direction, but that's not where we expect a durable response. And I'll show it data that that's actually what's going on. Okay. so. These materials accumulate in the bone marrow um, and then they interact with multipotent progenitors and hematopoietic stem cells that we've um, evaluated with flow cytometry protocols. So in the, in the bone marrow, you can clearly see that these multipotent progenitors and hematopoietic stem cells, they, they, they take up um, these nanobiologics. Uh, in tumors, we see it exclusively in the myelo cell compartment, not in, in lymphocytes. And okay, so then you should pay attention to that uh, square or with not two. So through not two activation, we get metabolic and epigenetic rewiring in the bone marrow. Um, and so that metabolic rewiring, we can uh, image by FDG PET imaging. And so we essentially administer a glucose analog that is um, uh, radio labeled and allows us to look at glu glucose consu consumption in the bone marrow of mice with, uh, in, in vivo. And what we've also done, because you know, these metabolic changes result in epigenetic change, we also looked at you know, the epigenome. Um, and then we see there's clear rewiring, particularly in the multipotent progenitor cells. And then if you look at, you know, what processes are affected, that are all processes related to innate immune response and trained immunity. Yes, yeah? so like TNF alpha, or TNF production, myelo cell differentiation, IL-6 production. And so <clears throat> these are all processes relevant to the innate immune response. Okay, so what does this result in? Proliferation of stem cells and multipotent progenitors. And uh, we've also assessed that with flow cytometry, that's what you see here. Um, and so this is essentially the induction of myelopoiesis through trained immunity. Uh, there's more uh, stem cells and more multipotent progenitor cells. And then if you harvest the bone marrow and you subject these cells to a re-stimulation, you see that these cells have become uh, hyper-responsive, uh, indicative of, of a trained phenotype. And so essentially the bone marrow starts producing myeloid cells that have a, a trained uh, signature. Uh, <clears throat> what we can also do is PET imaging specific uh, for CD11B. So we have a PET tracer that, that is radio labeled. Um, um, it's a nanobody specific for CD11B. And a uh, numbers in the, for example, in the spleen, and that's, that's very obvious. Oh, am I still online? Okay. That looked like uh, I was kicked off. Okay. <clears throat> so that's what we see with PET imaging. Um, and that starts then to rebalance the tumor microenvironment. So look at the difference between initially immunosuppressive um, and what we think is that the immunosuppressive myeloid cells are being outcompeted by these tra trained myeloid cells that are very abundant because of, of myelopoiesis. And so <clears throat> the very extensive uh, flow protocols um, on, on different organs, on the bone marrow, on the tumor. And then you can see nice shifts from more immunosuppressive micro tumor microenvironment to a tumor microenvironment that is actually more anti-tumor. 
and that you, is, is most notably reflected in the reduction of tumor associated macrophages. Now, and, this, and so the, the rebalancing of the tumor microenvironment then results in tumor growth inhibition. <clears throat> so what we've seen that nanobiologic that we develop depending on you know how uh, how many doses we give and at what concentrations you this really nice uh, uh, dose response curve. Um, and here's you know some photographs of mice on the left a mouse that was uh, treated with PBS and on the right a mouse that was treated with let's say the, the most effective treatment regimen. So that works really well. Um, yeah, one of the, 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 of the feedback we got, you know, the, the, from, from a, a reviewer is like, okay, you can attribute these effects to the bone marrow, um, you know, can you design experiments to actually show that, that, that that's the main mechanism by which you get tumor growth inhibition. So what we've done is a, a bone marrow transplantation from mice that were e either treated with our nanobiologic regimen or were treated with PBS. And then we transplanted these bone marrows in, in, in mice that were <laughs> radiated. Um, we let these animals then recover and then do tumor inoculation. And you can see clear difference uh, between the two groups, <clears throat> you know, showing that there's a very significant uh, involvement of the bone marrow in um, in uh, in this therapeutic effect. Okay, um, yeah. So now we've rebalanced the myeloid cell compartment and we changed the tumor microenvironment. That also means that T cells have better access to the tumor uh, cells, um, and that you know then it makes sense to combine this with checkpoint inhibition and activate the T cells in addition to. Uh, the in induction of trained immunity. Now, the model we, the mouse model we use is notoriously difficult to treat with checkpoint inhibition, with checkpoint inhibitor drugs, sorry. Um, and, and so what we've done here is uh, we've done a whole lot of experiments, but I'm showing the example that we treat B16F10 mice or mice with B16F10 melanoma uh, with a combination of anti-CTLA4 and anti-PD1. Um, and that has no effect on tumor growth whatsoever. So the black dotted line shows uh, uh, placebo treated animals, and then in yellow, you see animals who are treated with a combination of anti PD1 and anti CTLA4, no, no effect whatsoever. If we first induce trained immunity with our nanobiologic immunotherapy and then do checkpoint inhibition, then we actually get tumor remission. And so what you see is the, the, the lower uh, graph. Um, this these are groups of 10 mice and five mice out of 10, we saw complete tumor remission. <clears throat> and again, this is a tumor that's notoriously difficult to treat with uh, immunotherapy. We also have very translational vantage points. So what we've also done in this study is um, work in non-human primates. Um, so we looked at biodistribution by, uh, of radio labeled nanobiologics, and you can see that Let's say that behavior of these nanobiologics is preserved across species. You see this very dominant uptake in, in the bone marrow, also in non-human primates, um, at a fa very favorable tox profile. Okay, so that's our work in cancer. Then we take the other side of that coin and it's transplantation. This is work we published in, in 2018. And in this study, we've done the exact opposite. And so we inhibit innate immune responses, and then we try to prevent co-stimulation. And so it's also like signal trees and signal two that we focus on in this study. Um, we focused on the mTOR pathway because that, you know, that's the main pathway that regulates trained immunity. And we developed a nanobiologic that integrates a, uh, um, an mTOR inhibitor. Um, same as I've shown uh, for these data in, in cancer, we see this very nice um, a bone marrow engagement, also of this material. Um, yeah, and so the, the progenitor cells, they, they are positive for our nanobiologic. And so this is also something that's regulated at the level of the bone marrow. And then we use a heart transplantation model, which is a uh, um, B16F10 mouse that receives a second heart from a BELP-C mouse in the abdomen. And it's connected to the abdominal aorta. So that means that there's blood flowing to it. it there's, um, um, there's a heartbeat, but it's not um, functional, the heart. 
And, and so by palpation, you can monitor uh, rejection and it, it is a very robust model. And typically the rejection is observed at day eight, sometimes seven, maybe nine, but on average, uh, you know, it is, it's very consistent around day eight, you see rejection, um, which can be observed because the heart stops beating. In this model, if you if you manage to get, keep the heart beating up to 100 days, that is essentially considered tolerant. So, <clears throat> so before rejection would occur, so at, at day zero, two and five, we give an injection with our nanobiologics, and then you can see that this results in a very nice prolongation of allograft survival. So, in blue and in white you can see um, uh, controls, eh? so they all reject before day, teen, day 10, so you know, around day eight. Um, but if you uh, apply you know, at day zero, two and five, and do intravenous administration of our nanobiologics without any subsequent immunosuppression, you see that there's, uh, there's very strong uh, promotion of allograft survival. But as you can also see, it's about 30% or a little bit more, maybe 35% of these hearts that survive um, up all the way to 100 days, uh, you know, which is considered tolerance. So what we also decided to do is to then also inhibit um, co-stimulation, particularly CD40, CD40 ligand co-stimulation. This is technology we've developed with Esther Lutkins, I, I believe most of you will know her. And so she works on these TRAP6 inhibitors and then we incorporate it in our nanobiologic. And then you can target that antigen presenting cell and then you prevent CD40, CD40 ligand co-stimulation. So if you look at that, it also works in yellow, but not as well as, uh, as our, you know, let's, let's call it the trained immunity inhibiting nanobiologic. And when you combine both, you see that, you know, most hearts survive up to 100 days. And so this is a way to induce immunological tolerance in the context of transplantation without the need of chronic immunosuppression and because you regulate this at the level of innate immunity. And that's what's shown here. So now we go, finally, we'll go to uh, cardiovascular disease. Yeah, and in cardiovascular disease, um, yeah, we're pretty advanced in terms of doing large animal work, and it's because we in integrate translational imaging, uh, MRI, we have the PET MRI, we, we do uh, also PET CT imaging, um, so that's very useful to integrate. Uh, this is, you know, this is a little bit off topic, but for, um, we're also pretty strong at, at trying to visualize all kinds of immune processes and myeloid cell dynamics using multi, uh, multimodality imaging. And so that's also technologies that we're building concurrently because it allows us to get in vivo insights in how our technology uh, works. Um, and for example, radio labeling of nanobiologics that allows us to, to look at this quantitatively. Um, yeah, here, here's an example of looking at these nanobiologics in, in, in different species. Um, so on the left here, you see a mouse. Has, that's a typical micro PET CT image. Um, in the middle, you see a, a rabbit. This is a PET MR image. On the right, a non-human primate. And so it gives a lot of insights uh, in living animals, how these materials behave. And um, particularly, again, in the non-human primate on the right, you can see that the spine lights up, lights up because of the accumulation in the bone marrow. Yeah, um, I, I don't think I have to educate you on, on uh, the pathophysiological process and atherosclerotic complications, yeah, but it's essentially lipid-driven inflammatory disease, chronic inflammation that results in the accumulation of, of lipids and um, immune cells in the vessel wall that can eventually cause plaque destabilization and rupture, thrombus formation, and, and that can cause uh, ischemic events like a, a myocardial infarction, stroke, renal ischemia, and also peripheral artery disease. And it's, it's still, I believe, the number one killer worldwide. <clears throat> so we think there's an opportunity also for this nanoimmunotherapy strategies in atherosclerosis. Um, and we started working on this in maybe 2008 for the first time. Um, that paper got published in 2013. Um, and then we have another paper published in 2014. And what we've done there is that we encapsulated 
simvastatin, which is a lipid lowering drug, but that that you should um, you know that you should not focus on here because we try to amplify the pleiotropic anti-inflammatory effects of the sim of simvastatin, and so we encapsulate the simvastatin in our platform. And then the idea is that. And here we don't really focus on the bone marrow, is that we intravenously administer these nanobiologics. That you can see here, there we go. Then they circulate. Um, and we'll zoom in on our coronary artery that is full of plaque. Um, and then these nanobiologics accumulate in the atherosclerotic plaque, particularly the, as you see them in, in macrophages and monocytes in the plaque. Um, and then if you patiently wait, that, you know, cleans up the vessel wall. Um, that is, again, it's a whiteboard animation, and I'll show with data that we can actually do this. Uh, so this, this is, uh, um, this are data where we show in an uh, APOE knockout mouse uh, model um, with advanced atherosclerosis. Uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I believe it's like around 16 weeks of high cholesterol diet. I and mean, then you can see with fluorescence molecular tomography and looking at, at protease activity, you can clearly see the benefits of a one week treatment regimen. And so these mice first develop advanced plaques and then we can regress inflammation in one week by four injections of the symphostatin nanobiologics. And so what does that translate in terms of, you know, quantitative histology? There's almost no CD68 present anymore in the, in the vessel wall. Um, of these animals. Um, and so we've done a bunch of studies. Um, I, I think we published maybe three or four mouse studies with the uh, symphostatin HDL. Um, yeah, and one of the things we were very interested in to see if we could scale this technology and we could apply this in large animals of cardiovascular disease. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 APOE knockout mouse that has been on a high cholesterol diet for a very long time can be pretty heavy, maybe not 30 grams, but you know, they, they tend to be at least 25 grams and we can grow them even bigger. Um, but just to show you the, 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 the relationship between um, these different animal models, and you see that uh, you know, a, a rabbit is about um, 100 um, mice. Um, and a pig is about 2,000 mice. And um, so the, the implication is that, you know, we can produce with uh, microfluidics technolo technology, we can produce these nanobiologics, but um, yeah, for an animal of 60 kilogram, it's, uh, it's it, you know, that's, that's a pretty difficult task. So um, this is work we published um, about a year ago. Um, and so, you have to kind of be smart if you want to do this type of work in large animals, uh, because we, we, we can't, like we do in mice, you know, include 500 mice in one st study. And it's not economically feasible, and it's also not ethical. And um, so then in this study, we also developed uh, imaging methods that as surrogate markers for biomarkers for uh, immunological processes. So this is really a bioengineering study where we scaled the technology. This, this is François Fay, who used to be a postdoc in my lab, is now a system prof professor in, in, in Paris. He worked on the production of the symphastatin nanobiologic, uh, you know, I, I, I'm thinking maybe four to five months full time. Now, the integration of imaging is very important because uh, again, we work with large animals, uh, so that that's, that's costly and, um, and you also want to minimize the amount of animals that you have to use for study. So if you can do in vivo studies, that's very useful. And that's why we integrate uh, PET imaging with MRI. And then you get these type of data. So this is a little deceptive because this is actually not PET MRI, but this is PET CT. And the nice thing about PET CT is that for whole body biodistribution studies, that is a uh, you know, very efficient technique. And so they, <clears throat> these are the typical data that you acquire um, uh, using PET-CT and radio-labeled nanobiologics. If you then want to zoom in on the vasculature in these atherosclerotic rabbits, the, the, let's say the atherosclerotic lesions is in the abdominal aorta. Um, in atherosclerotic pigs, it's in the um, femoral arteries. 
And so with MRI, you can kind of zoom in on what's happening at the, at the level of the plaque, and then you can see clear targeting of these nanobiologics to the plaque. And that's what we uh, show in both rabbits and in pigs. But it ultimately is about you know, therapeutic efficacy. Um, and so there's a few processes that we focus on. Um, you know, we want to look at plaque morphology and vessel wall thickness. We want to look at plaque inflammation that we do with FGG PET imaging. We also want to have a surrogate marker for, let, let's call it, you know, monocyte recruitment. And that you can do with uh, dynamic contrast enhanced MRI that, that is a measure for vascular permeability. And we've also performed FLT PET imaging. And FLT is a, is a, a radio tracer that shows proliferation. So if there's proliferation of macrophages, in the plaque, then that's a, um, an imaging method that you can use as a, as a surrogate marker. And <clears throat> um, yeah, these are pretty extensive imaging protocols. We use two radio tracers, so actually one um, uh, scan session or, or, or you know, one evaluation is actually two days, two consecutive days. And so we do two scans. Then in a period of two weeks, uh, the animals receive four injections of symphastatin nanobiologics. And then at two weeks, we apply the same imaging protocol. And they get these type of data. And there's, there's not much you can extract from these data. I'll be, I'll be uh, frank here. And so on the left, you see FDG PET imaging, so in, in, in red and yellow. On the right, we see FLT PET imaging. And if we look at dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, we see all kinds of changes and then also we look at vessel wall morphology and and so these are very extensive data sets we were actually struggling with how we could best analyze these data and how we could increase power and then we involved in biostatistician and she came up with you know something elegantly simple she said well let's take every parameter you measure whether it's uh, inflammation whether it's proliferation whether it's permeability or vessel wall thickness and just compare pre and post treatment with placebo or symphastatin and nanobiologics if the parameter increased or decreased. Um, yeah, so this is actually a pretty effective model. And what you see is that in placebo treated animals and rabbits and in pigs, the majority of the parameters that we measure pre and post go up. Well, the exact inverse happened in, in the animals who were treated with the symphastatin nanobiologics, so you see that the vast majority of the parameters goes down um, in that period of two weeks. And so this is kind of clever way to integrate bioengineering and, and, and these kind of statistical models uh, to extract meaningful information from, uh, you know, from um, large animals that, you know, uh, that we, you know, are uh, limited group sizes. Okay, so to, to summarize, um, yeah, so we regulate the, the immune response using that nanobiologic technology. Um, we primarily focus on, on hematopoietic organs as, um, as a means to orchestrate the immune response. Um, I mostly focus on the bone marrow, but we suspect that there's also pretty important contribution of the spleen. It's not something that we have investigated in depth. And then, and uh, we, we try to translate it, you know, this type of work to large animals. So this, as we really have a translational vantage point. Um, and then uh, you can think of many applications. So uh, you can think of obviously cardiovascular disease, as, as I've shown, we're, you know, we're also investigating this in the context of myocardial infarction, and stroke, um, rheumatoid arthritis, all kinds of autoimmune disorders where potentially th this can have benefits. And that's about let's say, the inhibition of inflammation or inhibition of trained immunity. In the promotion of trained immunity, as I've shown, that's very effective in cancer, but um, it, you know, it can also be used to enhance resistance to all kinds of infections. And then I always need to, or I always conclude with the acknowledgements. Um, and thanking you for, um, you know, uh, sh letting me share uh, our work. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Willem. This was a very interesting presentation indeed. And I think it really shows how with, when you integrate um, 
knowledge in, in, in basic immunology and uh, nanochemistry and imaging, uh, you, can, you can get to, to develop very potentially very interesting immunotherapeutics. Uh, let's go to the 